ships all the way from uh, way, way uh, west side of San Antonio. And uh, how many of y'all like rats? How about mole rats? You don't know about mole rats? We're going to learn a lot about mole rats right now. Please help me welcome Dr. Rachel Borkins. <laughs> guys for staying to the very end. Um, I know you've had a lot of information pertinent to human aging and I'm hoping that one you'll find this information I'm going to tell you about more rats a light relief from all the heavy stuff you've been dealing with but also that you'll go away from here learning what a very important and useful animal model the naked mole rat may be for aging research and in particular for human aging research. So before I start, I just want to mention, in case I run out of time, that this work has been pretty well funded, and also I'm going to be presenting. Can you all hear me? Now we can. Okay. And that all the work I'm going to be presenting today has been done by students in my lab, uh, highlighted by the people involved over here. The green are the students in the lab, and the black are the collaborators that I have. So. A brief outline of what I'm going to do so that you can follow along with me. The first thing I'm going to do, especially seeing I'm a bit disturbed that so few of you know about naked mole rat, <laughs> is I'm going to give you an introduction to what is a naked mole rat, why I think it's very important for biomedical research. Then I'm going to tell you in fair detail a little bit about their resistance to growing mold and their resistance to cancer. And as to get a little bit more insight as to the mechanisms, I'm going to share with you some of our information about their resistance to oxidative stress and other kinds of toxins. And I'm going to <coughs> then focus on what I think is a key mechanism that may be terribly important in their incredible resilience and that may have translational application down the road. So what is a naked mole rat? A naked mole rat see in this little video going around is neither a saber-toothed sausage, <laughs> even though it does resemble one quite dramatically, if you, especially if you look at this little picture. Um, it has a hairless, mouse-sized rodent that is only found in the Horn of Africa, in Kenya, Ethiopia, Somalia, Eritrea. It's a strictly subterranean species. Um, it lives in an extensive maze of underground burrows with nests as deep as eight feet beneath the soil surface. And the only signs that there are animals living below the ground are these tiny little volcanoes of soil that they kick out. You can actually see their sand being kicked out in this particular image over here. But why we're interested in men aging is that they're the longest lived rodent known. I collected animals myself in 1980. And my last animal from the original cohort died in 2011. So that meant these mice-sized rodents, instead of living three to six years, lived an awful lot longer than they should have, and did so, it seemed, in relatively good health. So as a kind of quiz, let's just go back to the slide here. Looking at this image, in which tube, the top one or the bottom one, do you think you've got the oldest animals? Hands up for the top. One, hands up for the bottom, three, four, okay, well, you're both right. Um, the female in this tube over here, this big fat pregnant female is in her mid-twenties, and most of the animals in this tube over here are over the age of 25. You'll see a few little guys, there's one being squashed by mom over there, she tries to squeeze over him in the tube. But you can see that regardless of whether they're a breeding female, <coughs> showing no menopause, or just an old individual, most animals show similar levels of activity. What you might not know in biology is that every single feature that you look at, with the exception of circadian rhythm, scales with body size. So if you were a zoology student in the old days, you'd have learned about the mouse to elephant curve, you'd know that a mouse has a higher metabolic rate than an elephant per mass specific tissue. And the same is true of every other feature that we can think of. And it's also true of maximum lifespan. So here we have maximum lifespan. Can you still hear me even though this isn't with me? Is that better? So we have maximum lifespan as a function of the log of body size. And as you see that as an organism gets bigger, 
so maximum lifespan increase, such that for every doubling of body mass, there's a 16% increase in lifespan for the species. So an elephant lives about 80 years and a mouse lives about 3 years. If you have a look at this relationship, the first thing you'll notice is that humans and naked mole rats are major outliers in this relationship. Both live much, much longer than predicted on the basis of their body size. And if you change this relationship so that you're looking at it expressed in a different way called the longevity quotient, if an animal lives as long as predicted on the basis of body size, it has a longevity quotient of one. If an animal lives twice as long as it should on the basis of body size, it has a longevity quotient of two. And you can see that both naked mole rats and humans have a longevity quotient of about five meaning they live five times longer than predicted on the basis of how big they are. And we think that this is a very important <coughs> tool for trying to understand the mechanisms that may delay or attenuate aging in our own people. So, I'm sure you've heard a lot about longevity and how to increase lifespan over the last few days, or you've learned a lot about aging. Here I have two different human profiles that I want to share with you. On the right hand side, we have the oldest documented with reliable records human that ever lived, a French lady called Jeanne Calmont. She died in 1997, having lived 122 and a half years. She was born in 1875 when she was a young girl. Van Gogh used to go into her father's art shop. Uh, when she was 90, she sold her apartment to her lawyer on the grounds that she could live there till she died, and she outlived him by 15 years. <laughs> he let her stay there rent-free, mind you, for her entire life because he thought it would be just a couple of years. It was in central Paris, so maybe it was worthwhile, I'm not sure. But what is really interesting is that if you look at her traits that she had, what enabled her to live so long is that she smoked for 100, 100 more than 100 years, from 19 to 117, two packs of cigarettes a day. She drank two glasses of red wine per day. She remained active until 110. She took up fencing as a sport at 85. She lived on the fifth floor of a walk-up apartment in central Paris. Uh, and she attributed her longevity to wine, chocolates, olive oil, cigarettes, and her sense of humor, and was commonly known for saying God had forgotten her. She he buried all her children, all her husbands, and she had multiple of those too. So one would say she probably had good genetics, given all the other wonderful features that we know are not meant to be so good for us. On the left-hand side, we have a South African, Flying Full, as he's known. He's in the Guinness Book of Records for the fastest centenarian to complete 100 meters. His pace was pretty pathetic. It's 36 seconds, if any of you are runners. But having said that, what is really interesting about Flying Full was that he ran half marathons until a week, not a week before he died, at least a year before he died, but for over a hundred, in his hundreds, he was running marathons. He, at the age of 67, had a major heart attack. His doctor told him that if he didn't change his lifestyle, he would not make it to his daughter's wedding. And so at the age of 67, he became a vegetarian. He started exercising for the first time. Um, he never drank, and he worked as an accountant until the week before he died. So here we have two different scenarios. One where we think intervention might have played a critical role in his incredible longevity, and the other was a genetic profile. I'm hoping that Jean Calman's way is the better way to go, and I'm hoping that I share some of her genes, although I don't smoke or do some of the other things that she did in her lifespan. But here we have secrets to aging. Genetics and lifestyle may play important roles, and I'm not sure which of these is the more critical? When we look at the naked morets, we similarly see a very healthy aging profile. On the wheel over here, we have a 27-year-old breeding female who is running to her heart's content, and one of the animals in her colony is dying to have a turn on the wheel. 
but he or she is not going to be very successful. The breeding female, as everybody in the colony, maintains activity, body composition, cardiac function, vascular function, basal metabolic rate, hormone levels, molecular function, everything we have looked at to date for at least 75% of their maximum lifespan, which would be equivalent to a 92-year-old human able to do the same. And as you can see, the lights have gone off and she's still motoring away there. <laughs> she's very similar to flying foam. We see no cancer in these animals and we also see no signs of tumors. So we think they might be an interesting model for looking at healthy aging, which is what we all really hope that we can achieve in our lifespan. Interestingly, we do not know what kills naked morals. It's been a real bane of contention in my life. We see a lot of signs of aging. We see sarcopenia. There's my other picture. Oops. Oh, my other picture's disappeared. Never mind. Um, we see signs of sarcopenia, we see a parchment-like old skin, we have some very fat animals. This animal weighs three times what it should based on its body size, it's 120 grams instead of 35. We see signs of cataracts, although the animals are blind. Uh, we see lots of signs of periodontal disease, but I think that's just end-stage disease when an animal stops eating, the bacteria accumulate in the mouth and cause those kind of last late life uh, disturbances. We see gastrointestinal issues, we see lots of lack of the skin, we see very high levels of beta amyloid, the protein that's meant to be linked to Alzheimer's disease. We've never seen a single incidence of cancer in our colony. We've seen some examples of cardiovascular disease, but when we've monitored changes in cardiovascular function, we see that it's very much attenuated, almost no change in heart function from a one-year-old animal to a 30-year-old animal. So it seems to us that these animals show a very delayed aging profile and a compression of morbidity, which is so that age-associated diseases are only evident in the last quartile of life. Another interesting feature of the mole rats is that they don't show a menopause. They breed until old age. Our oldest female that we had breeding was more than 26 years of age. And interestingly, the older established females maintain higher fertility. So if you compare the fertility of the young breeding female, a female at two years of age who was a breeder, and a female at 26 when she was a breeder, you'll see that the breeding females, when they're older, more than double body mass during pregnancy. The younger females don't show as big a change. The older females have much larger litters than the younger females, with the biggest litter that we've ever seen, 30 cups in a litter, being evident in a 26-year-old animal. Quite remarkable. Pup mass is about the same, so it seems that fertility doesn't really change. If anything, it improves with age in this species. But what is interesting also is that although fertility doesn't change, pup survival in those older females isn't as good as in younger females. The animals also seem to maintain their bone quality for most of their lives. So here we have bone from a two-year-old and a 24-year-old. This is just done histologically through the mid-shaft of the um, femur. Upper <coughs> and you can see we've done it using PET scans and various other mechanisms, but the histology shows these lovely lag lines just like a tree. And you can actually try and age the animal by the number of growth rings you see there. You can also see that the bone is as thick and it as, is as dense. And there's signs of bone remodeling. There are these little Haversian canals which seem to be doing their thing. When you look at trabecular bone, if you take a longitudinal section through the bone, on the left we have mouse bone. He has a young mouse at four months, another mouse at two years a naked mole rat at two years, and a naked mole rat at 24 years. And the first thing you'll notice is that in the young mouse, there's this black line that runs all the way through it, which is the growth plate. And regardless of whether you're a young mouse or an old mouse, the growth plate is pretty much intact. You'll see the purple, which represents bone, is much thicker in the young mouse than it is in the old mouse. And that the old mouse, by 24 months of age, which is about three quarters of its lifespan, half its lifespan, I should say, um, 
the bone is already very much thinner and the animal has a lower bone density than it had when it was young. Contrast that to the naked mole rat. At two years of age, you can see the growth plate pretty clearly. You can see the bone is much thicker to start with. But by 24 years of age, there's only a tiny little bit of growth, growth plate over there that's still evident. And you can see the bone has been totally remodeled. So for people studying aging, for bone aging in humans, using a mouse model really isn't appropriate. Mice do not remodel their bones. Humans and naked mole rats do. And naked mole rats have mechanisms in place such that old bone has many more of these struts running through it providing structural support. When you look at the brain, you see also interesting phenomena with regard to aging. We've counted the number of neurons in the hippocampus, and we find it doesn't change with age. And here you can see those data. We have data from a two to three year old, a 10 to 16 year old, and a 20 plus animal. And you can see the number of neurons in all three age groups is about the same. So there's no neuron loss. Interestingly, we found very, very high levels of beta amyloid in naked mole rat brains. So here we have uh, the soluble 1 to 40 A beta, and we have the more toxic 1 to 42 A beta. And you can see that young animals, some have none, but a lot have very, very high levels. And that this doesn't seem to show an age effect. There are always a few with none, but there are equally many with lots of levels in it. We compared the naked Morad A beta levels to that of a triple transgenic mouse that had been genetically engineered to express high levels of human A beta. And if you have a look at the blue squares, you can see that naked Morads have much higher levels of A beta than these triple transgenic mice specifically designed to develop plaques and tangles. And if you look at the images of the uh, brains of those triple transgenic mice, you can see lots of big brown splodges which represent the tangles and the plaques that were formed and attributed to the very high levels of their A beta. Despite the fact that naked morads have much more A beta than most triple transgenic mice, we see no signs of plaques and tangles. So we think they have mechanisms in place to protect their brains. And we'd like to be a little bit controversial here and say that A beta might be protective. Maybe what the reason you see high levels of A beta in human Alzheimer patients is that the disease has overwhelmed the protective mechanisms. And that A beta's real function is to protect the brain and it does its best until it gets totally overwhelmed um, by the disease or whatever's causing it. So we think maybe there's a little bit of barking up the wrong tree and blaming a beta for all the pathology that you see in Alzheimer's disease. It might be something else. Don't know yet, we have to do the studies, obviously. We've also looked at glucose tolerance in these animals. And for those of you who've ever done a glucose tolerance test, you eat the equivalent of a 200 gram bar of chocolate and you take your blood immediately beforehand and every 15 minutes until your blood returns to normal. Uh, we did this for the mole rats, but instead of letting them eat their high sugar, we actually injected their sugar to make sure it got into their system. And we did this in young animals shown in pink and old animals shown in blue. And we found that regardless of age, they showed the same level of glucose tolerance. When you gave them the glucose, their blood glucose rose, and then it slowly came back to normal. Interestingly, their blood glucose tolerance resembles that of a diabetic or someone with insulin deficiency. Because what should have happened, which is what happens in the mice and in humans, is that <coughs> blood glucose should peak very suddenly, insulin should kick in, and levels should return to normal within about an hour to an hour and a half. In our case, it took nearly three hours before blood glucose had completely returned to normal. And we're trying to get a handle on what might be responsible for this abnormal glucose tolerance test. We also looked at basal metabolic rate changes with aging. Here we have moles of oxygen per gram of body weight as a function of age. And you can see what happens in mice. Uh, mice show more than a 50% decline in metabolic rate when they go from one year to two years of age. 
Morets, on the other hand, start off with a lower basal metabolic rate than do mice, but they maintain it all the way to 20 years and beyond. So based on this level of high metabolic rate throughout their lives, we've worked out that naked morets have the highest lifetime energy expenditure of any known mammal. And yet, the next obvious question is, do they succumb to oxidative stress? Do they have mechanisms in place to protect them from oxidative damage, considered the number one cause of aging all the way through? So once again, we did some experiments where we measured here reactive oxygen species in heart mitochondria. And we did these measurements in isolated mitochondria subjected to a whole range of different kinds of substrates that would either promote reactive oxygen species formation or suppress them. And we compared naked mole rats and mice. We tested every way along the electron transport chain. And we found regardless of where we looked, there was no significant difference in naked mole rats and mice. So both species produce the same amount of reactive oxygen species in the heart. We looked at this also in other tissues. And we found that the effect in the different tissues varied considerably. In the case of skeletal muscle, the data would support our hypothesis that naked morites produce less reactive oxygen species. And the same was true of the kidney. But one could hardly argue that the heart isn't an important organ. And yet it is the heart that seems to have the same level of reactive oxygen species as the other two. So clearly, in some tissues, naked morats show better protection or have mechanisms to reduce RAS, but this doesn't correlate with organ function or organ importance. The next question we asked was, maybe they have better antioxidants to immediately neutralize the reactive oxygen species as they produce. So we looked at several different antioxidants. Here we look at enzymes. We looked at copper zinc superoxide dismutase, manganese superoxide dismutase, uh, glutathione peroxidase. And we found that naked morets had slightly higher levels of copper zinc superoxide dismutase. But when it came to glutathione peroxidase, they seemed to be almost totally deficient in this very important antioxidant that hydrolyzes hydrogen peroxide into water. So clearly their oxidant defense mechanism isn't particularly impressive in terms of neutralizing reactive oxygen species. We've also looked at various other kinds of antioxidants, and we found that there's really nothing special about the naked mole rat. If anything, it has a worse antioxidant defense mechanism or suite of mechanisms than does a not. We also look to see if maybe they have other mechanisms, if they don't have the antioxidants to neutralize the reactive oxygen species, maybe their cells are protected in other ways against reactive oxygen species. And so we looked at membrane composition, because the fatty acid makeup of membranes will determine its vulnerability to oxidative stresses. And here, for the first time, our little beasts start behaving like we would expect. We found that the naked morats had a much lower peroxidation index than would be predicted on the basis of body size. So their cell membranes have much more of omega-6 fatty acids, N6 fatty acids, than omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids are much more vulnerable to peroxidation. And when you look at this peroxidation index, it does not correlate with body mass, but it falls perfectly on the line for the relationship between peroxidation index and maximum lifespan. So maybe their cell membranes in all their cells just have ways of being less vulnerable to oxidative damage. At least that's what the membrane information suggests. So obviously the next question that we would then have to ask is do they get less oxidative damage? And surprisingly we were floored again to find that despite the fact that they live so long, they have incredibly high levels of oxidative damage. Here we have lipid peroxidation, isoprostanes, much higher in heart and muscle, MDA is another marker of, iso of uh, arachidonic acid-based oxidative stresses, and we see again it's much higher in liver tissue. This is done in animals that are physiologically matched, so this is a four-month-old mouse and a two-year-old mole rat. 
and this is a two-year-old mouse and a two-year-old mole rat, and you can see that there's nothing special here about mole rats being able to maintain lower levels of oxidative damage. Quite the contrary, whether you look at fat acid oxidation, protein carbonyls, which is protein oxidation, and DNA oxidation, naked mole rats have much more damage than is observed in a mouse. Very surprising finding. And of course, it starts challenging a key theory of aging, the oxidative stress theory of aging. When we looked at the DNA oxidative damage in more detail, we found that the DNA in the nucleus was not different in terms of the amount of damage it incurred, but the mitochondria bore the brunt of the oxidative damage that we'd seen. Similarly, when we looked at protein oxidation, here we have just a normal protein schmear that's taken when you do these fancy kinds of blocks so and you can see all the different proteins in the sample. When you test using a fluorescence assay for carbonyls, which are these oxidatively damaged proteins, you see that not all of these proteins get the same amount of damage. In fact, there are only two proteins over here that bear the brunt of that damage. So the next thing we did was to see if these were special proteins whose job was to mop up all the damage and protect the rest of the cell content. And we found that these two proteins were periridoxin, which is an antioxidant, so you would expect that it would be an oxidative sum. But the other protein that bore the brunt of this damage was triphosphate isomerase, an important enzyme in the glycolytic pathway. So that tells us why on earth would an anaerobic enzyme be bearing the brunt of oxidative damage, and is its function impaired in the process? So we measured function of TPI, and we found that function was not impaired by having all this damage attached to it. So clearly the damage was not attached to the functional part of the enzyme, but was somewhere else on the molecule, enabling the animal to still function normally. <clears throat> Similarly, we looked at oxidative damage in tissue slices. Here we took carotid blood vessels and we cut them into segments and we subjected the segments that were now bathed in tissue media to different levels of hydrogen peroxide. We went all the way up to one millimolar, which is a pretty concentrated amount of hydrogen peroxide. And we measured DNA fragmentation using the comet assay and we measured caspase activity, which is the enzyme responsible for apoptosis and cell death, uh, using a caspase 3 marker. We found that mice in blue at very, very low concentrations of hydrogen peroxide already start showing a lot of DNA damage. <coughs> in contrast, the naked morat DNA seemed to maintain intact even at really, really high concentrations of 1,000 micromolar. When we looked at caspase activity again at a very low concentration, you're already seeing signs of apoptosis being activated. And in the case of the naked morad, it was only when you got to that ridiculously high concentration that there was a sign that caspase activity was activated, but there it was much, much less than what you see taking place in the mice. So clearly, in tissue culture, they're very tolerant of high levels of oxidative stress as well as what we saw in vivo. The next thing we did is we took cells in culture and we subjected them to a range of different kinds of oxidative and other kinds of stresses. So here we tested them with zinc, cadmium, chromium, these heavy metals all induce oxidative stress. Doxorubicin, which is a potent chemotherapeutic oxidative stressor. Um, Camptothecin, which is a chemotherapy as is MMS. And then DMBA, which is a very potent carcinogen all known to interfere with oxidative stress and, and DNA in particular. And we looked to see at what concentration of these various toxins did 50% of the cell population die. And we found that naked morats required much, much higher concentrations to kill 50% of the cells. And it ranged from a 2.4-fold change in concentration all the way to a 100-fold difference in terms of the amount of damage or the amount of the concentration of stress needed to kill those cells. So they seem to be very resistant to toxins and must have mechanisms in place that enable them to survive 
the kind of toxins that are thrown at them. And the first clue we got as to how this might be achieved is shown in this next slide over here. <clears throat> what we did in this slide is we, before we subjected the cells to toxins, we in, uh, added BRDU into the cell media. And BRDU is a marker that tells us if the cells are proliferating. And so when you take the cells afterwards, you measure how much BRDU was incorporated, and it is only incorporated when DNA is unwound and cells start proliferating. And so we looked at that in mouse and naked mole rat cells given chromium. We gave them different doses of chromium. We chose a dose of chromium that 70% of the mouse cells are still alive. So it's a very low dose. 100% of the mole rat cells are alive at that dose. And you'll see that mouse cells are proliferating as normal. Mole rat cells have already stopped proliferating. Less than half of their cells are now going into division. And as we increase the dose of chromium, we notice that mole rat cells completely stop proliferating. In contrast, mouse cells, even at doses that are killing just about every cell that's in their little dish at the time, those few cells that do survive continue proliferating as though nothing is wrong. And so they're proliferating with mutations and damage in their DNA, whereas the more red cells, if they perceive that the environment is suboptimal in any way, immediately stop proliferating. And that speaks to a paper that was published that we think we can explain the answer to. There was a very exciting paper that got a lot of attention which said mole rat cells show contact inhibition. They never grow to confluence. They don't like to touch each other. And because they won't touch each other, they won't get cancer. The cells will stop growing before that. And we find that if we grow cells under optimal conditions, where we feed them every day, and we grow them in low oxygen and in a low glucose media, the cells grow to even a higher density than do the mouse cells. So we don't believe in contact inhibition. We just think that if conditions are even slightly suboptimal, they immediately stop proliferating. And we think that this is a very important component to their cell survival. So, so far we've shown you that the animal is tolerant to different kinds of stresses. We've shown you that tissue segments are tolerant to different kinds of stresses. We've shown you that cells are tolerant to different kinds of stresses. The next thing I'm going to show you, which I think is even more fascinating, is that organelles <coughs> within a cell are tolerant to different kinds of oxidative stresses. So here we have data taken from the proteasome. The proteasome is the garbage machinery of the cell. It's the garbage disposer that takes damaged proteins and recycles them into amino acids. When you increase the concentration of oxidative stresses, mouse proteasomes immediately start malfunctioning and die so that the protein that's now been damaged stays in the cell and leads to the aging profile that we've always attributed to oxidative stress. And so the mouse proteasome is very sensitive to oxidative stress. In contrast, the mole rat proteasome starts off at a much, much higher activity, so it's maintaining much more pristine uh, cellular environments, they're getting rid of damaged proteins much faster, and even at the very highest concentrations of, the, in this case, 4-hydroxy-nonamenal, which is a very potent oxidative stressor, the proteasome still maintains functions more than double what the best was achieved in the mouse. So we have quite a lot of evidence that they have this kind of resistance. <coughs> Not only are they resistant to high oxygen, but we found that naked morat cells, and in this case brain slices seen over here, are also resistant to very low oxygen. They don't care if there's too much oxygen or if there's too little oxygen, they can cope. So if you put a mole rat in zero oxygen for 24 minutes, it will not die. It takes 25 minutes for it to die. If you take it out at 24 minutes, it will survive. Here we didn't want to take too many animals. We started small. We took brain slices from mice and naked mole rats. The mole rats have bigger brains than the mice, so we can see which ones are which. We place them in exactly the same container. As soon as you take away the oxygen from the mouse, the normal action potential that you can see with electrophysiology ceases. And then when you restore the oxygen, the brain is dead and does nothing. So this is the mouse. Uh, as soon as the oxygen goes, it dies. 
when you return the oxygen at about 30 minutes, nothing happens. When you do the same with the mole rat, there's the normal action potential. After 30 minutes of no oxygen, it's still showing a little bit of an action potential, not as strong as when it was at zero, but when you restore the oxygen back into the environment, it goes back to showing very normal oxygen or act, uh, action potential responses. So we would really like to know in terms of stroke research how these animals can cope with no oxygen and why their brain doesn't die. And we've seen it both in cells and dishes or tissues in a dish and in animals now when we've put them in zero oxygen. <clears throat> We've looked at cancer resistance in the animals. I told you we don't see spontaneous tumors. So we decided to try and experimentally induce cancer. We did this by giving them oncogenes. We'd infect their cells with a retrovirus containing oncogenes that are known to cause the cells to transform and become tumorigenic in every other species. And we also did it using chemicals which are known to be carcinogens. So in this first slide, we see that we, when we use these oncogenes, we tag them to a green fluorescent protein. We used rat cells, mouse cells, human cells, and naked mole rat cells. We, when the cells turned nice and green, we implanted them in immune-compromised mice in the kidney capsule and again behind the ear. And we waited to see if they would form tumors. In the case of the rat, within two weeks, you had palpable tumors. And this is what the inside of that rat looked like when we euthanized it in two weeks. You can see the cancers everywhere. Wherever the green is, these are the transformed cells. I can't even see where the kidney once was, but you can see the stomach, the liver, the kidney, everything is full of cancer. When we did that with the mouse cells, the same thing happened, except that it took a month before we felt palpable tumors. And human cells took about the same length of time. When we killed the cells at a month for a naked mole rat, we could see this tiny little green dot telling us the cells were still alive. So we thought maybe the cells are just slow growing. So we did another set of cells and we left them there for more than six months and the same scenario played out. This is the tissue from the six month old. The cells are still alive. They <coughs> definitely are stained with the oncogenes that we know that they have been infected, but they simply don't form the tumors with these oncogenes that do that to every other cell known. We did the same with chemicals. Here what we did is we painted the skin of shaved mice and non-shaved naked morats. You don't have to shave them, they've got very little hair on their skin. We treated them with either acetone or we treated them with this nasty chemical, DMBA, which is something equivalent, it's an anthracycline, similar to what you would get if you ate lots of barbecued, nice brown burnt meat, the part I like the taste of the most, nice carcinogen. <laughs> and then we aggravated the skin for months on end by twice weekly painting the skin with TPA, which is an inflammatory agent, which causes tumor promotion and progression. Uh, the mice by nine weeks started showing signs of tumors. By 14 weeks, every mouse had a tumor. You can see them here. There are these black dysplastic nevi, which are pre-melanomas. There's some other kinds of cancers growing on the skin. Not a single naked mole rat developed a cancer. When we looked at the genes to see what was happening, we started <coughs> getting some clues. The mole rat skin had shown very little changes in genes. About a thousand genes had changed with six months of treatment with DMBA, whereas nearly 5,000 genes, 4,500 genes, had changed in the mouse. And this was in skin that wasn't covered with a cancer, so it was the adjacent kind of areas. The next clue came when we looked at DMBA just 24 hours after treatment. And we found as soon as we gave Morax DMBA, 2,000 genes had changed their expression in the mole but only about half that number had changed their expression in the mouse. So the Morax are very much more responsive to a stressor and immediately react to prevent that stressor from causing harm by neutralizing it. When we looked to see what genes were being regulated in the Morax, most of the genes were involved in the removal of damaged products. So we have removal of aromatic carbons, removal of xenobiotics, the proteasome which we showed you earlier is also upregulated, removal of nitrogen compounds upregulated. Whereas in the case of the mouse, 
We have an immune response that's upregulated. We have cytokines promoting inflammation and promoting the cancers that you see. So how do the naked mole rats do this? We've been trying to find a mechanism because if we don't want to just describe all the changes that you can see, we actually want to try and find out how it is they're able to stop this process and protect their body. And we've honed in on a key protein called NRF2. NRF2 is the master regulator of cytoprotection. It regulates more than 600 different genes and we think it's playing a very important role over here. So what normally happens is under basal conditions, NRF2 is bound in the cytoplasm to keep one. A little bit of it gets into the nucleus where it binds to the antioxidant response element and it upregulates constitutive protection through producing antioxidants, heat shock proteins, and the proteasome, as well as detoxifying. Under conditions of oxidative stress, such as pesticides or endogenous reactive oxygen species, nerve separates from heat, and it, more of it enters the nucleus, and it upregulates big time all these detoxification pathways. So you've got more antioxidants, more proteasomes, more heat shock protein units taking place. And we think the proteasome in particular is very important in this role. So we looked to see if NRF2 was upregulated in the mole rat relative to mouse, and sure enough, NRF2 levels are more than double that of the mouse, and downstream proteins that are linked to the NRF2 system are also all upregulated in the naked mole rat when compared to the mouse. In fact, the only one that is downregulated in the naked mole rat is KEEP1, the protein that prevents NRF2 from getting into the nucleus and actually doing its thing. So we think the proteasome is terribly critical to the pattern that we're seeing. And we started wondering if we saw that the proteasome activity was higher, we also saw that the proteasome was resistant to oxidative stress. So we wondered if there was some other mechanism that was protecting the proteasome. Because if your garbage machinery can stay good at getting rid of garbage in the cells, you can maintain a healthy cellular environment. And so we once again checked with oxidative damage what happened to the proteasome. We found when we treated cells with cadmium, naked more proteasome activity increased dramatically in contrast to the mouse where the proteasome was damaged and destroyed. We also found that when we looked at proteasome activity with a range of different kinds of proteasome inhibitors, we used chemotherapies that are commonly used for cancer patients, we used vinyl sulfone and we used bordesomib, which is used now in multiple myeloma. We found naked more proteasomes were incredibly resistant to these proteasome inhibitors. So if you look at the concentration required to inhibit 50% of the activity, you need 160 times more bordesomib to stop the naked more proteasome from functioning. So we then wanted to know what it was that protected the proteasome in this way. And we came up with a really cool, very simple experiment. This is my favorite data, and it's the second last slide, so I can spend a bit of time on it. What we did is we took liver homogenate from mice, and we took liver homogenate from naked morons. And we spun them in a centrifuge, and we collected the proteasomes, and we collected the rest of the group, the supernatant. And then we took the naked morad supernatant and took it, put it on top of the mouse proteasome, and we took the mouse supernatant and put it on top of the naked morad proteasome. If this was just a proteasome function, swapping the groups should have no effect on proteasome activity. And we found just the opposite. When we took the mouse and naked morad, we started off with 100% activity. When we added an inhibitor, the mouse was very sensitive to inhibition and decreased by 60%. The naked morac was insensitive to inhibition and stayed above 90. When we swapped their supernatants, now the mouse shows inhibition resistance and the mole rat has lost its inhibition resistance. So we know it's not the proteasome function, it's something in the supernatant that baits the naked mole rat proteasome that protects it and enables it to maintain viability. So the next obvious question was, if 
the naked mole rat super naked can protect mouse proteasomes, can they do the same for human proteasomes? And can they do the same for other species? Is this transferable outside of rodents? And so we took human proteasomes that you can commercially buy, and we measured proteasome activity without an inhibitor and with an inhibitor, and sure enough, they are able to be inhibited. When we bathed the human proteasome in the mouse supernatant, the inhibition was even worse than when it was bathed just in buffer. When we bathed the human proteasome in the naked morat supernatant, not only did we lose this inhibition by these nasty toxins, but the human proteasome doubled in activity. So there's something in the naked morat supernatant that not only protects human proteasomes, but also modulates their activity and increases their function. And so we think that this is a very exciting phenomena that we're seeing over here and we're currently trying to get a good handle on what is the mechanism that is present in the naked myrat cytosol that is offering this protection to mice, to naked mole rats, to humans, and also to yeast proteasomes. So I'm hoping that what I've convinced you today is that the naked mole rat is an interesting animal model with which to look for mechanisms that may delay aging and associated diseases. The founding father of comparative biology, who won the Nobel Laureate for his work on frog capillaries in 1928, he identified a capillary for the first time, said that for every biological problem, there's an animal species in which the problem is best studied. For him, frog skin enabled him to identify what a capillary was and how it worked. And I'm hoping that you will agree with me that the naked mora is an ideal model for challenging current dogmas of aging and forcing us to have a better understanding as to how the aging process works. And with that, I'll once again thank the people who did the work. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Do you have any questions? Yeah. We, that's a big project going on in my lab at the moment. I have a PhD student who's measuring tau and looking for neurofibrillary tangles. We're doing some cognitive behavioral patterns that are taking place there. And we're trying to get a handle on what's going on with regard to tau and with regard to beta amyloid. Interestingly, tau is also really high in the naked mole. Again, making us think that tau and beta amyloid may be trying to protect the brain in some way and are simply overwhelmed when the disease takes hold. Anything else? Question. Who else around the world is doing naked mole rat studies besides Barsha? Oh, there are lots of people now. When we first started, we were the only ones. I think there were five or six labs, and now I think there are about 80 labs working on naked mole rats. Mm. So it's getting exciting. We've got lots of new people and lots of new expertise all contributing new and novel findings and confirming many of our data which make me happy. Yeah. All right, thank you so much.